So thank you again uh, for giving the opportunity. Um, and I would like to introduce first my co-speaker, Jeremy. Uh, he has 20 years plus experience and um, a pretty passionate about machine learning and deep learning um, and its applicability to the financial services. Um, in the last three, four months, I've been uh, interacting very closely in the uh, AI for uh, MIFOS and standardization of the platform. So I'm quite happy to have him on the uh, as my co-speaker. And uh, Ed doesn't need any introduction, right? So, and then it's next me, I'm Lalit. And um, Jeremy, slides have gone. Uh, yeah, next. Right. Sorry, Martin. sorry. Sure, that's fine. And I'm Lalit. Uh, I'm pursuing my PhD in domain specific search engine uh, after working for about 20 years in the industry. Uh, and I suddenly find it privileged to work for an open source community and me for in specific because all through my career has been in the banking technology. Uh, we move to the next slide. Jeremy, you want to talk for the first slide and then we go into the subsequent sure, slides. Wonderful. Okay, so one of the questions that we brought up was why does um, data science matter? So if you had to look at your old brick and mortar banks in, in the old days, a lot of transaction was happening at the teller, et cetera, et cetera. And now with the rise of neo banks and, and the world going to the digital uh, paradigm, we have found that there's a lot more di uh, data that is accessible and, and ways of doing banking. And obviously the rise of neo banks. And from that, AI has now, as, as there's, there's a space that's, that's been made apparent that it's, AI has got, has got great potential that's, that, that, that you can use with all this data, that's the various data lakes that we can tap into, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just on, on one of the points, the analysts and experts estimate that AI, um, using this data um, and making it possible with AI and creating various um, processes, um, they, they predict that AI will save the banking industry roughly $1 trillion by 2030. And that, 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 that is phenomenal. If I just take South Africa, one of our banks, Standard Bank, um, going to the digital paradigm, they actually, they, they about 10,000 of the employees, they, they started let, letting go slowly but surely. And the main reason for that is that a lot of the, the, the process of being digital, digitized and, 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 by doing that and incorporating AI, it's, it's, it's made it a lot more powerful. And in saying that, if you had to consider um, your customer experience in that regard, is that your customer doesn't need to go to the teller anymore. They can they term it self-driving finance. So what, what essentially can happen is that the clients can go on, online, they can do their banking online, and, and it's, it's, it's already happening around the world. But um, there's so much more that can be done with it. Um, and we'll give you a, a, a demo later on in this regard. And, and not just that, and with the rise of IoT, um, if you had to take in, 20, in 2019, on an average day, the world is producing 2.5 uh, um, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, gigabytes, um, well, trillionbytes, sorry. And um, if you all that data, if you can tap into that data, there's a lot of data that one can use to create more profitable business models. Um, that's, 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 that, that shows that there's a lot more power in that regard. And um, for instance, I'll give you a perfect example. If you take a smartphone, we've actually, from an AI perspective, um, and doing credit scoring, if you had to take um, a person's SMS as their, their, their messaging service, when somebody defaults, for example, um, an SMS gets sent to the, to, the, to the customer saying, please don't forget to pay your loan, you're outstanding one month. Now, by using AI to get or, or, you, or, or extrapolating that data and using AI to actually work with that data, um, you, you can create better uh, profitable business models in the sense of people won't, you can, your credit risks, you can quantify better results in that regard. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then on the RPA-based systems, um, robotic processing automation, um, 
tasks that people would do, your, 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 your staff members would do on a daily basis, which is repetitive tasks. You can get AI that's, that can sort that out for you, that can do that for you. And the thing is they can do it 24-7. So they very it's, it's very powerful in that regard, um, and 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 there's no need for human intervention. So that's pretty much why there's so much more that we can say about why data science matters. But those are that is pretty much it in a nutshell. For going on trying to achieve financial inclusion using data and 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 using um, data science um, in, in in that paradigm. Great. So uh, we thought we'll touch upon some of the use cases that have relevance for banking. Um, I know AI data is now the new new uh, buzzword or uh, new paradigm in terms of how uh, digitization is happening or digital transformation is happening across organizations. Uh, when we look at from banking perspective, you could see it I know the front office, the back office or the middle office, they're all merging. But suddenly, if you look at from a customer perspective, AI can be used in terms of personalization. AI can be used as advisors. AI can be used for authentication or authorization. My face can be used directly for recognizing rather than I key in a password. And, and uh, yeah, chatbots. Uh, if you look at the middle office where uh, we feel a lot of operational efficiency would kick in, uh, you could look at doing some risk management, credit scoring, uh, which we have done to a certain extent in the MIFOS. You could do your bank statement analysis. You could do uh, any of the data analysis on the statements for banks to process the records faster, better, and more accurate. Right? Uh, it, it also certainly is going to help in terms of regulatory compliance. I know a lot of organizations are already taking the path of uh, robotic process automation. In the recent times, if you look at McKinsey, um, the organization that I work, IDFBT, in collaboration with Microsoft, uh, we have done quite a bit in terms of evangelizing, talking about various use cases and an approach in terms of adoption of AI for banking. Um, what I listed is only just just a scratch on the uh, uh, on the entire surface of uh, what AI can do for banking and financial services. We see a lot more potential. Next slide. Yeah, so with, with that as the background, we started a journey on AI in MIFOS for the last three, four years now. Uh, uh, we made some attempts in terms of chatbot using an open source NLP. Uh, we used, uh, uh, PPI for identifying the uh, poverty probability index so that when when we have to really look at financial inclusion, uh, we probably uh, have the agent or the uh, person in the branch goes to that location, takes some pictures and then it does some calculation and says, yeah, this is the state where the customer is and probably you could do some uh, product design accordingly or this is from financial inclusion perspective. Uh, more recently, we started working on the credit scoring. I know this is currently a hot topic uh, when we want to do any automation in the lending process. Uh, what we did is uh, we understand when we started the journey on the credit scoring, this has been going on for the last two, three talks at MIFOS. Uh, when we initially started, we realized the biggest problem is lack of data sets. What is available as public data sets is, is not good enough because the way that every organization wants to do credit scoring to a large extent is, is secretive or probably their own uh, USP in terms of whether they want to give a loan or not give a loan. So we felt one basic need is democratization of data uh, so that smaller organizations can benefit. Second, uh, the feature sets uh, is, is also a challenge, right? Um, and in we built for the GSOC, we actually went about giving flexibility to the end users to create the features, define some parameters uh, so that the data transformation, the encoding that you typically require in terms of converting from text to numeric can all be automated and requires minimal or almost less coding. So 
the thoughts that started emerging is how do we reduce the development time how do we uh, that can be used for various use cases how do we do some data democratization and if you see in these three use cases that we built we did one for uh, using sklearn the python libraries in one case we used open nlp in another case we actually went about using google uh, okay so uh, am i still breaking or am i audible now we can hear you now um so do i need to disconnect something or am i good here now can you yeah you're good lala please continue okay thank you um so uh, what we realized is uh, in this journey we we the developers are uh, from a tactical perspective we realized that we used to what is most suited at that point in time but when we actually have to deploy in the production or when we have to develop our system we need to start standardizing some of these libraries on prem or on the cloud so these were the thoughts and these thoughts actually helped us to Move to the next slide, if you could. Next slide, please. Yeah. So these thoughts started putting us into some kind of a framework. The working group in May first, about a month, month and half back, to see uh, seek support from the partners from the. Uh, developers in the GSOC community, and uh, whoever had any interest in terms of we first uh, community development. What we discussed is to see how we can look at some platforms and if we can draw some boundaries in terms of what we can do. This is our proposal to see if we can get some uh, machine learning libraries which could do some. Uh, whether it is rule based, whether it is supervised, whether it is deep learning, uh, rather than each of us in our own journey. So at least we know these are the machine learning models. But we all AI, machine learning is one key part, but a lot goes in terms of data processing. How do I process? It is very essential to make sure that I remove the models to the extent that we are we get the clean data that the model can use. You know, data processing similarly representing the information and knowledge in a graphical format can give better reasoning so we started drawing this straw man in terms of putting use cases at the top layer then what are the various content form unstructured text we could get structured data which is typically what we would have in the relational database we could have images which we already did in the ppi project or the speech Right. Uh, if you, we we know in some interiors literacy is still a challenge, and speech could be an alternative in terms of authentication. Could be an alternative in terms of checking balances or even doing some transactions. So with that, we started putting a straw man or a component diagram in terms of how we visualize the uh, platform that we want to standardize. So with that thought, we started putting in terms of time loan, timeline what we could do. In the next one one and a half years, so that the momentum continues, and we could deliver something for the community. I request the next slide. So these are our early de deadlines, and it's important that we put some deadlines so that we have some targets. We work towards it, and we could probably create some motivation among the community to seek some more partnership, some more support uh, in driving the initiative. Uh, so we are looking at in the next quarter that we at least have a common understanding on what are all the various use cases. There are enough reference material, uh, but yeah, we want to make sure that the community has a common understanding on uh, use cases that we could get out of the system, and then start our journey in terms of the platform uh, finalization. Do we want to use cloud? If it is cloud, whether we leverage H2OI or we use 
Azure or we use AWS or if you want to do multiple, what are those APIs? What are those uh, feature sets that we can push or get? Uh, if we want to do it on-prem, what is that library that we could use uh, so that we have a, a common understanding again uh, across the platform? The, later, we want to do the development. And I know it's six months is not sufficient, but yeah, at least six months, we could start showing some a deliverables that way the community starts building interest and and they don't go about implementing it and create more awareness so i i'm almost at the end um, but i uh, wanted to create some excitement and see how the uh, approach or what we are trying to take as a direction uh, we will take questions at the end, but meantime, I request uh, Jeremy to go to the next slide and then take over in terms of the demo. Sure. Okay, so in regards to the slide that you're looking at right now, this is an onboarding process. And what I'll be showing you is, is, is what you see now, I'll actually show you in a live demo, where a customer would go online, apply for a loan, and, we, and I'd show you the various steps of where the AI comes in, obviously one of them being fraud and anomaly, um, doing your KYC, um, doing bank statement analysis, and then at the end, obviously, from a machine machine learning perspective, um, then pr um, predict which products would be good for that customer, and that is all based on gathering data through these through these various steps that you see. Um, at the end, we ha we have collected 130 attributes, which we then can make a decision on whether the person is good for a loan of a certain amount and a certain period. So just to kick off, just having a look at that, I'll then go and I'll start the demo. Okay, so just to show you, I'm going to be using my testing client. So as you can see, um, what we book, this is all, Finneract is a core system that we've used and we've obviously enhanced it and added a lot of AI models and functionality to the process, um, which has made it, which, 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 which has actually taken it to the next level in that regard. So just having a look here, so we call it Alec and what Alec does is it does your bank statement analysis. So just to show you that, that we're doing this live, you can see there's no data here. Um, and that data will be produced when we do the onboarding process, which I will show you now. So this is one of our channels um, of, of, a, of, a, of a loan LMS front end in South Africa, um, which we've plugged onto the Finneract core banking system and incorporated all the other various microservices. So this whole, this whole infrastructure is just to add to it, is running on Kubernetes. It's on Azure uh, Kubernetes cluster, and it's all digital, and it's all cloud-based um, with various microservices. So I'm just going to go through the steps. So obviously, I've already registered, so I'm just going to use my name. So one of the things that we do, we found over time, is that we need to, while we're doing this process, we try to keep it as, as, as minimal as possible. So... We can quantify going through these steps and using AI that we can disperse a loan within between seven to 15 minutes. Um, if you had to take, as I mentioned in the, in, in, in the first slide, if you had to look at your, your brick and mortar banking methodologies, it would have most probably taken you two days because somebody has to go do a bank statement analysis, see that you qualify, do affordability, do KYC, know your customer, et cetera, et cetera. But we have all encompassed that into one process using various AI models and techniques. So I'm just going to go through. So obviously, I've already added my, my banking details. I include my employer details. And just adding on that, there's various attributes that we've asked the client to fill in. And the reason being for that is that when we use these data points, a perfect example as your employer, if, for, for example, the person is working for a, a government entity, you know that they're working for a solid environment or corporation so they are likely to get paid well very likely to get paid at the end of the month but if it's a if it's an individual that's just opened a little company um, and it's a startup you don't know how long that company is going to last but taking in those attributes into your algorithm as various data points 
you've got a lot, you can do a lot more waiting in that regard. So I'm just going to carry on. So you go, we, my employer. So this is where this stuff gets interesting. So yeah, what I do is we've actually built in two scenarios. Just to, just to give you an example, we've actually plugged in to all our major banks here in South Africa. So we can get digital statements, digital transactions directly from the banks and then do um, AI on that, which Alec does, bank statement analysis, all the other stuff which I'm going to show you now is that we, uh, we, do, we, we ask the individual if they don't want to do that, they can upload their bank statements that they've downloaded from their online banking, etc. And we then do OCR off of those, those bank statements and then we do bank statement analysis on that. So I'm going to just do the OCR method. Okay, so now what it's basically doing in the back end, and this will take a few few seconds, is it's checking bank validation. So we plugged into, into a, a credit bureau that will tell us, yes, the individual has got banking details. Um, their bank validation account is, is legit, compares to their ID. We then do uh, bank statement analysis. So right now the system is doing OCR. It's extracting the data off the, 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 the PDFs, and it's, doing, it's, it's using Alec to do bank statement analysis. And what it essentially does is that it categorizes the various spend of an individual. It defines your salary, which days you get paid on, but I will show you that later on in, in, in once, once we've completed. And then once it's done that, then, it, then after at the end, which you'll see soon, so uh, it will then produce a result saying that Jeremy is she's good for a loan, as you can see now. So we've actually done a few steps there in those few seconds. We did bank validation. We did KYC. We did credit bureau checks, credit check. We did um, affordability check, and our AI predicted that I would be good for a loan of 6,500 Rand over three months. So that's quite a lot that you've done in literally a few seconds. Now, if you had to take that and you had to use your old banking systems, it would take you a lot, lot longer. So in doing that, you can quantify your OPEX cost because you can have a reduction on your staff. You don't have to, your, your staff complement doesn't have to be that big. Um, the other thing is that you don't have to, you can produce better results. And this also comes back to the first slide, where it's self-driven banking. So the customer is, 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 is experiencing his own, his own loan process without any other individual or human being interfering. So I'm just going to go through this process. I get a quote. I accept the quote. It gives me my pre-agreements. Um, I'm happy with the pre-agreements. I then accept it. It sends me an OTP. Um, which I will get on my phone. My phone is on silent. Okay, maybe that's wrong. Maybe because it's a demo customer, it's, it's not going through. So nonetheless, so what it's essentially done is, is that it's then shown, it's, it's, it's now done. So I'm going to go to the back end just to show you what it's done. So let's go back here. So if you see now, initially there wasn't a loan in this section. Um, so through those processes, I showed you that we had no data here. So from the AI analysis, we then did, looking at my statements, which I can show you, it picked up AI used NLP, which is natural language processing, which is a form of AI. It used that and various algorithms to depict off, this, off my um, scanned statements, my four-month salary, um, my vehicle expenses, my fuel expenses, um, insurance expenses. And you can see it's on a monthly basis because obviously I, you pay a premium. What's your rental expenses, your cellular expenses? Um, and then trans transfer transactions, um, and there's a whole load more. So your medical expenses, um, transfer income. So with doing that, we then using AI, we have taken the call. We've taken the what somebody would have been would have done themselves, an individual at the bank. The AI did within literally a few seconds, and as you can see, it's categorized the spend according to what it picked up, and then at the top, it's then quantified a disposable income, 
which says, okay, great, um, you've got that disposable income, and then you can carry on further with the, the loan in that regard. So that's how I came back with a figure saying that I qualified for a loan of 6,500 Rand over so many months. Um, and just to show you the various attributes that we have taken into consideration is that we plugged into the credit bureaus, as I said, in South Africa. So we tend to take all these account details. We pick this up, and these are all part of, of, um, of the attributes that we consider during, during, during our AI. But let's just get back. Let's just take one step back. Regarding the, 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 the process of just doing bank statement analysis, but the prediction process of it as well, is that it's not as simple as what people tend to think is that you take 2 million observations, you have 130 attributes, and you've got a target value. Target value is you then, as we know, machine learning is, is, is um, it's supervised, so it learns from pre previous data. And, but it's not as simple as that. When it comes to finance, you've got to consider various things. You've got to, you've got to understand um, um, your roll rate. What we mean by roll rate? If a person defaults on the first month, do we consider that as a default? No. Something could have happened. They could have changed banks. Do we, if the person defaults on the second month, do we consider that? Well, maybe, maybe not. But on the third month, we then should start considering, yes, this is a defaulted person. But what sometimes happens is that they might default on the second month, but pay on the third month. So that is where your roll rate, you need to work out what your roll rate is and vintage analysis. So what vintage analysis is, is literally taking previous months and looking what is your, 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 your default rate and your loss rate in that regard, looking at, 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 at previous data. And, and besides that, if you had to look at um, the various attributes that you take into consideration, if you look at weight of evidence, so essentially what weight of evidence is, if you had to look at somebody that's got a disease, um, let's take uh, cancer, um, there's, or a flu, you've got five attributes. Um, you've got a cough, you've got a, a, a runny nose, your throat's sore, your chest is tight, and you've got a headache. Now, you could weight those accordingly um, to predict that you would get a flu, but they're not all weighted at the same time because you could have a headache, and a headache could mean that you haven't had enough sleep, um, you haven't had enough water for the day, so the weighting on that would be very minimal. But if you've got a flu, a, a, a runny nose would have a higher weighting, so your weighting evidence and information value on, on a runny nose would be a lot higher because if you've got a runny nose, the chances are good you've got the flu. Um, and the same with um, if, if, you, if, if your chest is, is if you, you've got a cough, um, if you, it doesn't actually mean that you're coughing because you've got the flu, there could be something stuck in your throat. So your weighting will be a lot less in that regard. So those are the various things that we need to consider when we incorporate these algorithms and use them to predict the, uh, whether a person has defaulted or not. And um, yeah, there's a lot um, of algorithms. Yeah, and Jeremy, Sorry. I don't want to cut your demo short, but we're getting close. We have about five minutes left, and we do have a number of good questions in the chat there. So hopefully you and Lalit could start to address those. So the first one we had yeah. was from James, and he was, you know, mentioning the usage of federated machine learning algorithms. And I think this aligns very well with the approaches we were proposing, Lalit. So perhaps if you both could respond to James's question there. And then Sankar and Godfrey had some questions as well. So we'll try to get to all of those. Okay, great. That's right. Do you want to give the first one a go? Yep. Yeah. I'll go ahead. So James, yeah, we have taken the federated approach. We are not saying this is the only algorithm. And uh, when we say federated, yeah, there would be multiple algorithms that could come back and make one prediction. And even for models, there would be multiple models or multiple machine learning algorithms that would be available in the tool set. Uh, we are not proposing a model or a algorithm. So um, we have taken uh, what we are also doing is in the proposed approach, we are saying not only limiting to the on premises, but uh, we would make it available as an API. So if you think that, or if the community thinks that there is a powerful uh, uh, tool set that's available with Azure or AWS or H2O, they would have that flexibility to go and connect to do the modeling or. Uh, 
that machine learning stuff in happen speed. If I can just add on to that, um, uh, James, is that we part of my uh, dissertation was is that I used uh, deep learning to do credit scoring and and just to, to, to add to that, the, as 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 things tend to progress from a data point of view and big data and data mining is that using IoT, you've got a lot of unstructured data and a lot of your algorithms that are being used now for credit scoring is your machine learning algorithms. So we are, we are starting to test and play around using deep neural networks to do credit scoring on, on unstructured data that's very dimensional in that regard. Um, because obviously neural networks love complex data, um, not your, your straight to the straightforward um, kind of data that you would get. Where do you live? Age? How much is your salary? Etc. Um, you can start tapping into social media. Your digital footprint can be very, can be very powerful in that regard. Just adding on to that. And then, Sam, your question. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Jeremy. I was like, you're going to tackle those too. So. Okay. How are you generating the data? Trend? So in, in in South Africa, we've um, we've been doing it for a few years. We've gathered data. But just to give an idea, there's various, if you go look on UCL demo, um, where they use for Kaggle, there's various data sets that you can get from there. And there's dynamic data that one can use, predominantly person's age, um, where um, do you own a home? Um, what is your salary? What is your credit risk? Um, do you have children? Are you married? Are you divorced? How? Um, you know, those various attributes, those are dynamic attributes that one can use. And that's where this whole this whole idea is coming of democ democratizing um, AI and da data is that we need to slowly but surely get all the other data forms um, to build the AI models um, going forward. And obviously from a digital footprint, coming back to what James asked, using neural networks, using a lot of other data um, lakes that one can tap into as not just your normal fundamental um personal, your, your KYC process, what is your ID now, what is your, your age, the data that you can use. But you need to, the, the thing is that you need a lot of data, obviously, to train your models. But using deep learning, and one example is using a deep belief neural network, which creates, which actually uses a restricted Bolton machine, creates features on its own, and then uses a feed-forward um, neural net after that to go further. They are for fraud, credit. Yeah, so Godfrey's there based in South Africa as well, Jeremy. So I'm not sure if you can speak to any of the pushback coming from the banks or lessons you've learned so far in working with them. Sure. Um, from data sets, I'll give you a perfect example. We we went to Saudi Arabia last year to start a digital bank in Saudi Arabia. And, and that was one of the very interesting environments. Um, because obviously you've got to go according to legislation. Obviously with the GDPR and South Africa, we've got the Papaya Act. Um, in in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, no data is allowed to leave the country. So everything needs to be in country. So that makes your your whole paradigm a lot more interesting because people are very secretive of data over there, and 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 and, for, and, and rightfully so. Um, so that makes it very difficult to build AI models in that regard. So what we did in that in, in that scenario. We went to all the credit bureaus in Saudi Arabia and we went and had meetings with them and tried to find out with who we could build up a relationship to get data from them, past data, to create our AI models going forward. And, and, and a few of them were willing to, 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 uh, to accommodate us in that way. Obviously, being part of the process and us using them as a service, but that was another avenue of, of getting that data and, 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 and producing data sets in that regard. And then, Jeremy, I think there's two last quick questions, and then I think we'll wrap up so others can go to the next panel. But one more question from Sankar, and then Natu had a question around regulatory perspective on deep learning for credit risk. Hi, is authenticity of the submitted documents in the Moodle example validated? So on our bank statements, with our banks, there's various points on the statements that we, that we know that the statements are, are, are valid. But besides that, we do bank validation, and I can show you that using, uh, if you look at my screen, we do bank validation at the bottom. This is what we use in South Africa. So from your bank statements and, and doing a bank validation, we then speak to the credit bureau and we actually talk to the bank and say, is this one of your customers? So obviously you can't see my account number, so they'll say the account number is open. 
ID number match, yes. Initials match, no. Could be uh, because my name is Jeremy Andrew Peter. Um, I generally just use JP. Um, name match, no. Maybe because I'm just using Jeremy. So in that regard, we then quantify an authenticity of data. We then use this as a benchmark, and that's part of our affordability or our analysis process to quantify if you are who you are and conclude the KYC process. So, uh, and if we could just add uh, one approach we have taken in the credit risk rating or credit scoring in MIFOS part of the project is we also are doing a rule based and a statistical measure so that if a with its black box in nature comes back and makes some recommendation, uh, the user of the system can validate what is the rule base saying and what is the statistical approach that's coming out. That way they have a complete view of all the approaches and then make a decision. Um, I know there is a lot of interest that's building on explainable AI um, and there are a lot of constraints that are coming out from regulators persp from uh, perspective in terms of using AI models that are more explainable. So uh, interestingly, in our approach, we have seen the decision tree based models performing relatively better in, in the terms of the data set that we have, which are certainly explainable, uh, on which there would be little or probably lesser uh, pushbacks from the uh, regulators. Yes, thanks. And, yeah, and I agree nice. with Olet. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go on, Jeremy. No, I agree with Olet. Is that um, you know we co we continuously try and and use alg other algorithms to to quantify a better approach. But one of the questions is, um, are you allowed to use deep learning for credit risk? Well, you're allowed to use any algorithm that you want, um, as long as you can quantify using a confusion matrix. Um, you, those metrics you can produce and do and doing. Um, statistical analysis on your on, on, on the metrics that you produce and you can show that to the bank that this is this is the scoring and also as I mentioned using explainers and then also showing the weighting on the various attributes you need to produce that and show the banks listen this is we, this is not just a black box I think I don't know if you've heard the, the theory the black box theory where you use a deep you use a neural network nobody knows what it's doing but it actually does what it's, it actually does the job pretty well. But obviously, using explainers, as Lynette mentioned, we can we can dive deeper into the algorithm and understand what the algorithm has actually done. And hence, there's various on a deep from a deep learning perspective, you could use. Uh, oh, there's a lot of algorithms in that regard. But once again, going back to what Lynette said, uh, decision trees, while well, gradient boosted decision trees, are very powerful in that regard. And so, thank you, uh, Jeremy and Lalit. We ran over a little bit, but we're going to let the next session get started. But I think we've got a small break after that, so that one can run a little long too. But really appreciate all the valuable questions that our audience brought to the table. And we really look forward to help drive this roadmap for AI for all on top of the Finnerac platform. And I pasted a link to how you can join the working group that we have on Discourse. So looking forward to incorporating more of the partners and volunteers in the community who have expertise in AI to join this group. So look forward to folks coming into our next session, which is gonna be on scalability. And thank you again, Jeremy and Lala, looking forward to working with you in the community. Take care, everyone. Nice See you in the next session. <laughs> Cheerio, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.